Galatians chapter number 2. Galatians tells one of the most crucial, important stories in the history of the world. There are certain times that you just see a, a word and it kind of tells a story all in one word. If you hear of Bethlehem, what do you think about when you hear Bethlehem? You think of Jesus' birth, the place that he came. If you think of Golgotha, the cross, you think of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary for us. The price that was paid. If you think of the resurrection, we're only, there's only one really, we really think of when we think of the resurrection. We think of Jesus Christ who didn't remain dead, but he came back to give life to us. When you think of Pentecost, you think of um, when the Holy Spirit was sent and the church was born. When you think of the Damascus Road, you think about Jesus meeting Paul on the Damascus Road and Though the gospel had gone to the Jews, now it's going to spread to the Gentiles. Paul was called the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul said in the book of Romans in chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. <clears throat> for the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Did you hear that? That's following the words of Jesus, to the Jew first, that's the beginning, but also to the Gentile. Galatians is really written because of the freedom that we have in Christ, the liberty that we have in Christ, but it was also written because of the controversy that had arisen over the Gentiles being saved, and the people of Galatia were uh, actually uh, Gentiles, so it was very personal to them. But Jesus' words were plain on the matter. In the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, verse 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. In Mark chapter 13, verse 10, And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Luke 24, 47 says, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, all nations, all nations. In the book of Revelation, those two words are put together, all nations, 19 times. Five times you'll see these words put together. Two nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongue. Five times, most of the time it's talking about people who are standing before the throne of God and God and Jesus upon the throne to nations, kindreds, people, and tongues. It's a tapestry of the glorious, beautiful of our beauty of our Almighty God. The honor, the majesty, the power, the dominion, and the great, 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 great praise that He so very much deserves. In Psalms 24, verse 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world's and those who dwell therein. I'm grateful that I'm one of those who dwell therein. God's grace made it possible for us to have life, and He wants us to live that life together. Jesus came that we may not only have life, but we may have it abundantly. And He called us to be one people under God. But our sin separated us from God, and it creates divisions one among another. Now, we are to be people who love, and I praise God for that. But God's grace wants us to always be together. And you've heard me say it from this pulpit so many times, and if you hang around a little longer, you'll hear me say it over and over again. Satan always divides. He wants to tear down what God wants to bring together. God's grace will bring us together, but Satan will not. He, that's his enemy. He wants everything to come apart from that. We live in a place that I agree is a wonderful place. I believe it's the greatest country in the world even today. It's called the United States. What a unique name. The United States. Maybe we should be called the divided people. Sometimes that's what we are. We're a divided people. But you know, our diversity has made us strong. Every person brings who they are 
their own personal strengths to the collective of our nation. And we are stronger together than we ever could have been apart. I think today we honor those who have gone to battle for our country and fought in wars for our freedom and some who paid the ultimate price, who gave their life. And we want to never forget them. We want to remember them. But one thing that we have found, we can take the example from our military. They came together as one. They didn't fight apart, and it didn't really matter who they were. We had the draft for so long in our country, and you just got the letter, and you said you came and you served. It wasn't because it was easy. It wasn't because it was something you really wanted to do. But we have an obligation because there was something that was bigger than the whole. And it really didn't matter what race you were. It really didn't matter what culture you came from. It really didn't matter if you came from the city or if you came from the country, if you came from the east or if you came from the west. You came together and you became brothers in Christ and you fought the common enemy so that freedom and liberty could reign. I'm grateful for that. We're not at war today, but are we? Satan is always trying to tell our, tear us apart. There's a term we all know the answer to. It's called a homogeneous unit. It means of the same kind, alike. You ever heard the phrase, birds of a feather flock together? People who are alike will congregate together. And that's what we find in our world today. We're different. We are the most diverse people, nation, in the history of the world. As a matter of fact, no one comes close. We've been called the melting pot. And we all came from somewhere else. Not too many Native Americans, but even they came here. They didn't start here. But this land that we have we congregated late in, and we became hopefully a unit of people, but we have become so separated. Now, church, please hear this next phrase, and I'm going to tell you it's not about race. That's not what I'm talking about today. It's about culture. There is a war that's being fought in the Middle East today. The children of Abraham the Jews and the Arabs. And Israel was attacked. There is something that the IDF has put together, a a film of October 7th, that they're going to try to uh, get together with the victims of it and all that and maybe fuzz out their faces and show things that happened that day. But it was pure anger. It was hate. But it's not, it's been happening for millenniums. It's nothing new. And actually, in our country today, we have people in our uh, colleges and other places around that are protesting one thing or another. One of the things that we have found is they don't even know why they're protesting. It's just culture, it's not race. Many think that it's just the, uh, Uh, Arab Americans that are protesting Israel in our... It's not. It's not. There's people of all races. I was shocked to see Chinese people who joined together with uh, others that hated Israel. Isn't it funny? Hate is taught. Hate is taught. And the ones who have hate feel justified in their hate, even though they don't know the reasons why. It doesn't matter if it's young or old, rich or poor, north or south, donkeys or elephants, progressives or conservatives. And by the way, I don't think either side understand the definitions of those words. We have a culture. But as Christians, we have a culture too. We are one in the bonds of love. Jesus said, 
You will know they are my disciples by how they love one another. The controversy in Galatians came over the Gentiles being saved. The Jews received the gospel first, and then the Gentiles, the Greeks, the cultured. Others, really when it says Gentile, it means all the rest of us, Jews and anybody else. But when the gospel came out initially, it came to the Jews. But then God had a plan. He spoke to Peter. He used it. And the Gentiles became saved as well. But then the Jews said, oh, that's okay and fine. They, weren't, they didn't warm up to it in the beginning because, listen, the Jews hated anyone else. But even in their own uh, religious doctrines and beliefs, if you wanted to be uh, of whatever country you were, if you wanted to come in and be a Jew, you could convert to Judaism. But then you had to do all the things of Ju Judaism. If you were a man, you had to be circumcised. You had to follow the Torah, the law of Moses. But then you had to also follow all the traditions of the high priest and all those things that had been brought down. And literally what they wanted was, okay, you can receive Christ, but you must become of our culture. And Paul, who was a Jew, who literally persecuted anyone who became a Christian understood the freedom that he had received in Christ. The forgiveness. The redemption. The pain of a debt. The freedom, the liberty, the love, the peace, the joy. Do you hear me? Can you relate? Old things are passed away. All things become new. And now he put aside the old. That didn't matter. The law did not bring him to Christ. It did, it did not make him perfect. The culture did not bring him to Christ. It did not help him in his walk. The Holy Spirit led him to Christ and became the leader of his heart and his soul and his mind and his thinking. By the way, it's the same for us. The voice from heaven, the wooing from heaven, the sharp elbows of the Holy Spirit that correct us when we do wrong, that steps on our toes, that encourages us to do good, that the, the love of Christ that was born in us, it, it goes abroad to anyone and everyone else. Heaven will be heaven because there will be no restrictions on the love of God. And heaven can be even on earth today if we will free ourselves up from anything else and only live the love of God. But culture is what we're talking about. And culture is taught by the world, not by the Holy Spirit. I'm okay that mom and dad did it. I'm okay that grandmother and granddad did it. I'm okay for the generation before but understand that the generation before them were was different and the generation from them that are different and the culture of germany was different before the wars and i pray that it will be different even today russia china india south africa brazil Canada, for the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof, the worlds and those who dwell with them, kindreds, nations, people, tongues, one Savior, one cross, one Lord, one resurrection, one baptism. And one hope. In our world in which we live today, we are so different. 
I was kidding Wednesday night, and I said, if you want to know the difference, just go to Walmart. People just from every place in the world at Walmart. We all got buggies. There's, we're one in the hands on the buggies, right? We go around and some are fast, some are slow. Some are old, some are young. Have y'all seen some of those videos on the internet of people who dress when they go to Walmart? God help us. The fights that occur in the parking lot over 10 feet. And you see all these people that come together, but are we really together? In Galatians 2, in chapter 1, they talk about circumcision and how Paul had to go to Jerusalem. This is Acts 15. And how he stood up and he brought uh, Gaius, a Gentile, with him. And they told about how the gospel is saving people Everywhere that they go and that churches are being formed and lives are being changed and families are becoming one and the love of God is doing an amazing work. And these are people who were not circumcised. And the fight, the, the Jews that followed Paul everywhere that he went to fight against him because these people were getting saved and they weren't following the culture. It's crazy, but true. When we get to chapter 2, hopefully they've decided in chapter 1 that, that you didn't have to become a Jew after you became a Christian. A Christian was enough. Titus was there. But then when we get to verse 11, this is after the conference in Jerusalem, and Paul's back at work, and, and he is at Antioch where he actually began uh, his first missionary trip. And now he's going back there. And Peter came to visit. Look in Galatians 2, verse number 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, this is Paul saying, he said, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Peter was doing something wrong. For before certain men came from James, that is, James, the brother of Jesus, who was kind of like the leader el elder in Jerusalem where all the Jewish work was being done. He says, For before certain men came from James, he that is Peter would eat with the Gentiles. He had fellowship with them. They spent time together. He gave great words of wisdom and of love, and they had fellowship. They were one in the bonds of love. But after these other ranking elders or whatever came from Jerusalem, it says in verse 12 that Peter withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. He acted one way, with the Gentiles when those other people were not there. But Peter, the rock, was afraid of how they would look at him and how they would feel about him and how, how they would talk about him. And he wanted to be accepted by them. So he, he removed himself from the Gentiles and, and, and went over to those Jewish people and he just ate and fellowshiped and hung out with them. This is why I'm telling you it is one of the most important words in the history of the world. They needed to settle this. Was Christianity for all or not? Would culture triumph or would the gospel triumph? Look what it says in verse 13. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him. Not only did Peter remove, but others followed along. And they started to do the things that Peter did. Leaders lead, folks. You can't help it. You're going to lead. Others are going to follow. That's really where we get our culture from. We're following what other people who are influential in our life, we do what they do. 
But he says, they played the hypocrite. Now that's saying that Peter was. But he says, they played the hypocrite with him. They became hypocrites too. So that even Barnabas, oh my goodness, Barnabas, he is the encourager. That's what Barnabas means, the encourager. Remember back when the church was being founded and, and Barnabas took all of the property that he had and he sold it and he gave it away so that others who did not have, uh, after they became Christians, so that they could have a living as well because the number one thing was to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out. So even Barnabas, the great man that he was, the great encourager, who went with Paul on his first missionary trip, even he was led astray by the power of the culture. Verse 14. You know, I'm going to shake Paul's hand when I get to heaven because of verse 14. When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature, born, and not sinners of the Gentile, raised, born in a different culture. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law, no, by, by, excuse me, by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. For by grace are we saved through faith, yet not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, how we live, what we do, lest any man should boast. Verse 17. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. God didn't do this. If you fall back into culture, rather than listening to the Holy Spirit. If you want to act like someone else that's playing the hypocrite, rather than the life that Jesus lived, if we have a, a, a person that we should follow, we should just look at Jesus Christ, how he acted, how he loved, how he gave, how patient, how full of joy, even while there were tears, not seeking his own will, but the will of the Father in heaven. And when he taught us to pray, he said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have a mandate. We have a pledge of allegiance. We have a constitution, the word of God. We have an opportunity, church, and if you have been influenced by culture, that's not your fault. But if you follow culture, it is your fault. Culture may be easy. It may be comfortable. But that doesn't mean it's right. Just because the generation before us did it a certain way and the generation before them did it a certain way, that doesn't mean that we have to continue to follow it. Every person who feels the wooing of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and turns their back on that, turns their back on everything and gives their heart and their life to God. And in the process of that, they receive all that God has for us in Jesus Christ. And we owe it all to Him. The love of of Christ constrains us. It holds us back and it propels us forward. He says in verse 18, if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If I go back and try to add Christianity to the culture, Or I let the culture enter my Christianity. I'm a transgressor. For I through the law died to the law 
that I might live to God. Say that words with me, live to God. Say it with me, live to God. Every day we get the opportunity to do what? Live to God. No matter what our circumstances, we get to do what? Live to God. No matter if you're at work, if you're at play, whether you're with a thousand people or if you're by yourself, what you should do in private, you should do in public. And what you do in public, you should do in private. We should live to God. Verse 20, one of the very first verses I memorized as a Christian, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for it is righteousness. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And we know that it didn't. We've got freedom, folks. We're supposed to put on our heaven suit. We're supposed to open up the microphones to the Holy Spirit, have ears to hear. We're supposed to let the love of God put joy in our heart. And we're supposed to live the Jesus life down here on earth. Uh, You ever heard anybody say, I don't want to go to that church because there's a bunch of hypocrites. You're right. Come join us. You're a hypocrite too. How many of us do what we know we should do all the time? How many of us are influenced? You see, what Satan wants to do is he wants to build those walls again. When I was young, I I was born in 1962. Had a birthday this past week. I'm 62 years old. I grew up basically after segregation had begun. I, I, I grew up when we went to school together, we played together. The 70s were a unique time because we were living out those things that we said that we would believe. And I always had a trouble with the fact that the most segregated hour in the country was at 11 o'clock on Sunday. Birds of a feather flock together. But yet when we're in heaven, there will be no separation. There will be no Baptist group, Methodist group, Pentecostal group. There will be no dancers and those that sit silently. There will be no singers and those who can't carry a tune. It's just going to be one throne in heaven and all God's people in front of it. Kindreds, nations, tongues, peoples. So why do we separate today? Culture. We're comfortable. Do we engage others? I mean, if Walmart looks so different, do we engage others? We should. We want to, but we seldom do. A church that had been struggling for years. They were doing this. They were stagnant. They were not growing. They had always done church a certain way, and they come to realize that if they continued to do it, they were going to die. So they hired a consultant to come in to help them understand how they could break the mold and move forward. So he met with them. What is the strength of the church? We're the most loving church. We are the most loving church. Okay. So then the next Sunday, he snuck in. Nobody knew. He showed up to church. The next Tuesday night, he met with them again to give him his results of his secret shopper. He just kind of slid in. And he said, so your claim is that you are a loving church. Absolutely, we're the most loving church. Everybody knows us as being the most loving church. He said, I came to church Sunday and no one talked to me. No one said a word to me. Everybody came in, 
did church, got up, and left. We were a visitor. Nobody shook my hand. Nobody asked me anything. He said, I tried to shake hands with some others. I tried to talk with them. And this was the most loving church. Now, hold on. Let me defend them for a second. The church had no clue. They were loving people. But their culture had taught them something. How many of you wish I could preach the most wonderful sermon in all the history of the world in 10 minutes? You didn't say amen, but I think you all agreed. And then I've got other people in the church that say, Pastor, preach on, preach on, preach on. It's just culture. We look at each other. I'll be honest with you, I dress differently than I used to. I was a business, I was a financial planner. I wore a suit and tie every day of the week. I polished my shoes four or five times a week. I always wore a tie. I always had a ring around my shirt because you had to have it buttoned up. Even if it was 95 degrees in the south with humidity, praise God, hallelujah. And oh my goodness, I'm glad heaven's going to be different. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I hadn't seen a preacher in a tie and I can't tell you how long. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I always roll down my sleeves and button them up, but when I get out of church, I roll up my sleeves. So I said, I wonder what if anybody will even notice if I roll my sleeves up. How many of you noticed it? Few. How many of you thought, that's strange. What is the preacher doing? Because culture. Culture. Someone told me one time, says, Preacher, at least you don't wear them blue jeans with all the holes in them. <laughs> I understand our church, our, our building has constraints. When I say amen here in a minute, you're going to flock out that way and you're going to flock out this way. And you're going to, within a few minutes, the, the building will be pretty empty. Some of you will meet in the parking lot and talk. Some of you talked a little bit in your small group in Sunday school. Some of you talked a little bit in the hallways. Some of us will talk a little bit in the, hall, in the aisles here. But our building is a constraint here, but the thing that the world needs today is communion and fellowship. More than ever. And by the way, how many times have you heard me talk about Sunday school and small groups? I want everybody. I want, and I'm not going to quit talking about it until everybody is in a small group or a Sunday school class. I'm going to talk it and talk it and talk it and talk it and talk it. But I, I don't want you to just meet eight people. I want you to meet everybody. And when we go down, last Sunday we had a meal. And it was good. How many of you ate with the same people you always eat with? It's culture. You're comfortable. Cheyenne got choked last week. I didn't know. But they went and got Lynn. And you struggled for a while. You were ready to drive yourself to the hospital. In our church, she's going to drive. How many of y'all would have drove her to the hospital? Absolutely. But she was going to say, no, 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 I'm going I'm to. I'm and then I, we got Donna. And she went down there and beat her to death. <laughs> Bent her over and Lynn said she did a kung fu karate chop on your back. Bam. And it didn't work, so she did it again. And then you smiled and said, I think that works. We had a person come to our service this spring. And uh, they sat down in the service. And uh, I was in the back shaking hands as I left. Please hear this. And after everybody had gone out that way, I came back in this way. They were sitting in the very same spot that they were during the service. And no one had spoke to them. So I went to them, sat down beside them, 
Laura doesn't want me to talk to her. Laura Wilson doesn't want me to talk about her. She wants to leave her alone. Let her come quietly to church. So I, okay. And Laura um, came over with me and introduced herself. And then I, I started introducing them to other people that were just standing around. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm trying to hold up a mirror here. Because I think one of the greatest things that God has done for New Holland Baptist Church is God's brought some loving people in this place. But if we don't start letting that love so shine, Sharon just joined our church, one of the most loving people. Becky's been coming. It hurt. She wants me to preach in 10 minutes because her back hurts. And I understand that. God's been bringing us visitors just about every week this spring. I don't know if there's any today or not, but just about every week this spring we've had them. The church, the, the world wants to know what New Holland Baptist Church is about. And they need Jesus Christ. And the greatest thing that ever happened to any of us in this room is Jesus Christ. And I'm just saying this. Any person should receive the same grace that I received. And you never know what somebody else is going through. We're going to have to change, folks. And that's the first thing that you hear that when you hear change, nobody likes it, nobody wants it. We're going to have to be open. We're going to have to do some things to let the, the world, they're not going, they don't know what we do inside these walls. I'm grateful for what we do inside these walls, but that the world may know. Y'all good with that? that the world may know. We're supposed to be commanded to take as many people to heaven as we can. Race does not play a big part in this. It really doesn't. It's culture. Birds of a feather flock together because of culture. Family and friends. It makes you may, may make you uncomfortable. We used to do this shaking hands in church before COVID. How many of y'all remember that? How many of y'all love that? Yeah, y'all did the y'all did the the Baptist circle. You get in there and we'd we'd all stand up, Mark would have us, and we'd do this. <laughs> right? About 15 people get out in the aisle. But half the time, you just went and shook hands with the same people you shook hands with the week before. And by the way, y'all sit in the same spot. And y'all would get so mad at me if I said, next Sunday morning, you are not allowed to sit in the same spot. You would be, you would be, that preacher's done meddling. He's just, he just needs to preach Jesus and leave us alone. Are we not creatures of habit? We're creatures of culture. Ones that we've developed. And Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Everything needs to be put on the altar for the one who gave all to us. There's some things I'm going to be talking about in the next week. Week after week, I'm going to be talking about what we as a church are going to do culture-wise in this world. I'm going to bring some things up to you that you're going to say, you're going to scratch your heads and you're going to say, really? And somebody will say, we've never done that before. Well, some of the things I'm going to ask you to do, I've never done before either. But Christ deserves our best. What was the verse, Mark? We're supposed to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Mark says it well. And our neighbor as ourself. That is the first commandment. That's the life. 
That's what we should do. If you don't know Christ, you don't know what we're talking about. But if you know Christ, you know what God wants us to do. If you don't know Christ, you may be longing. You may be lonely. But you want the joy and the peace that we talk about in this place. I pray God will bless you. We're going to have an invitation. But I just want you to ask, what is your responsibility in this? What is your part going to be in this? Maybe Brian's being radical. I want to be as radical as heaven. By the way, God's way of getting Jericho's attention was pretty radical. Would y'all agree? Pentecost was pretty radical. Would you agree? Maybe you want to stay in your comfortable circle. Bless you. But other people need your love that Christ put in your heart.